Hey, on this edition of Retro Combs, we're covering Chapter 8 of the Commodore Plus 4 User's Manual entitled Making Sound and Music on the Plus 4. Now, this is the last chapter in the Commodore Plus 4 User's Manual. However, take a look at this. This is what we've covered. This is Chapters 1 through 8. This is what's left. There's a lot of stuff left in this manual. At the end of the episode, I'll talk about some of the content that's in the back and how I plan to handle that in future videos. Yes, this is not going to be neglected. We are going to come back and cover that ending material in this user's manual. For now, enjoy this very melodic episode of Retro Combs as we explore making sound on music on the Commodore Plus 4. Okay, before I get started, I do want to remind you my previous video had some really great comments. And in that last video, I show you how to take a printed program, say out of a Commodore Plus 4 user's manual, scan it, convert it, and import it into an emulator or to a physical Commodore computer. It could be a Commodore 64, VIC-20, PET, Plus 4, any of those. But I show you how to do that. So be sure to check out that video. Before we get started actually making sound and music on the Commodore Plus 4, there's some things that we need to know. There are some unique things about the Plus 4 that's very different from the Commodore VIC-20, the Commodore 64, the 128, or the PET. As a matter of fact, all of those I've listed, the Plus 4's music and sound capabilities are not even close to those. Well, maybe the pet. However, you're gonna find through a discussion of the hardware that there are some limitations. So let's go ahead and talk about those limitations. First of all, the Commodore Plus 4 includes a TED7360. TED stands for Text Editor, which is how the C16, C116 Plus 4 and the unreleased V364 that had that cool speech synthesizer in it, uh, came to be known as the TED series of computers. The TED is an integrated MOS or MOS technology chip that handled video, sound, DRAM refresh, interval timers, and keyboard input handling. That was way too much for that one single chip to handle, but it was a way for Commodore to reduce cost. If you want to learn more about the TED chip than what I've just said, and there is a ton more, make sure you check out the companion blog post where I have a link to a page that includes a lot more information about the TED chip and why it was so unique for its time. But let's talk about what we've already learned about the TED chip. We've seen the five video modes the TED supports in chapter seven when we talked about graphics. Let's see what sound and music we can create using the built-in tone generator, of which there are two. One has a couple of different options that we'll talk about. This generator contains, as I mentioned, two channels. One is a square wave and a second channel, channel capable of either a square wave or white noise. You know that stuff you like to listen to uh, to drown out sound uh, in the background when you're at uh, work or in a hotel? The Plus 4 can generate that white noise for you. The TED is not as capable as the SID found in the Commodore CBM2, C64, Max, or 128. The TED was designed for business applications. Business applications weren't really hot on having a lot of fun sounds. And we have to remember that the TED series of computers, or the 264 series, or the Plus 4, was meant for business, not for games. It was only later after the release that people said, you know what, this thing can make sound, it can display graphics. Those two things together equals games. Let's try it. While limited compared to the SID, the TED includes a tone generator with two audio channels that creates music and sound. Combine the tone generator and the two channels and you can do some pretty fun things, especially when you throw in that extra channel with white noise. Let's dig in and see how we can use this tone generator to create not only music, musical notes, but also some very fun special effects or audio effects. The first program we're gonna take a look at is the very first one in the chapter. It is called, or I call it, Make Tone. It's on the companion disc at 08 Make Tone. And you can find, again, the companion disc on the blog post, and you'll find the link to everything you need in the companion webpage. For now, though, let's go ahead and load up this program, deload. 08 make tone. We're going to load that up here. We're going to list it. Here's our program. Now we're not going to spend a lot of time in each specific command, but here's a little secret for you. This entire chapter, all the sounds can be created 
through two commands, the volume command or VOL and the sound command. Now we're gonna break those commands down in the next program. This is just a program to kind of get us started. Let's kind of run through it quickly. First of all, we're gonna set a volume. Volume here is eight. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit later. We're going to do, we're gonna to continue to do something until something occurs. Here's our input. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to ask the user to input. And in line 35, you can see that we're going to ask a user to input a number between zero and 1023 because those are valid numbers. So if X is greater than 1023 or X is less than zero, then print zero to 1023, please. It's a very polite program. And then go back to 30 and ask for input again. So it may be polite, but it is a, it is a persistent little program. It's gonna keep asking you until you get it right. Once it does, it's gonna take that X value, once you input that correct number, it's gonna throw it into the sound command that has three kind of uh, pieces to it. It has this first one, which is the channel, it has the next one, which is the frequency, and then it has the next one, which is the duration, and then it's going to continue to loop until X is equal to zero. So now we know that X, or that zero, is our way out of this program. Let's go ahead and run this program and see what happens. Okay, so we see the first thing that happens is it asks, it has a question mark, which is asking for input. So let's let's try a value, let's do two. So you see two is a very low tone. Uh, let's try three. Could you tell the difference? Probably not, because between one and 1,023, that's a large range. You're probably not gonna be able to distinguish that. But I bet if we go to 10, you'll notice a little difference. So just a little bit of difference. Let's, what about if we do 20? 20 sounds pretty similar, right? Let's try 50. Mm, a little higher, let's go to 100. Ah, now we're getting someplace, 150. Aha, now you're starting to understand how much you need for a step in tone. Let's do 200. Now I could do this all day long. Let's go ahead and get some high tones. Let's go up to 1000. There you go, now that is a sound that will make the dogs howl right there. And let's do 1200. Oops, that's out of range, we can't do that. We know what's gonna happen if we do that. Let's do 1,020 to really get it up there. And there you go. So there are some ranges for you. Now remember, the program is smart enough to know if we hit zero, that it will exit out. Uh, so that's a nice little piece that's built in for us. So there is our Make Tone program. I mentioned I would spend time on the volume and sound commands. Let's go ahead and do that now. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the volume command. The volume command, has a single three character string, V-O-L for volume, you space, and then you enter a value between zero and eight. So zero to eight. Now, as you can imagine, you put a zero in, that's going to be a volume of nothing. Zippo, nada, you're not gonna get any sound. So I'm gonna go back over here and I'm going to put this to a five for now. So we've got kind of a mid volume. Now it's important to note that we are controlling the volume of the TED chip, not the volume on a monitor or an amplifier, just what's coming out of the plus four. So keep that in mind because if you're running that through an amplified system, it could get it's gonna give you some different results, right? Based on if you've got the volume cranked up, to, but, but it's still gonna get louder and louder as you use that command. The next command we have is the sound command. In this particular case, I'm gonna do this command right here. We're gonna do one, we're gonna do a comma, we're gonna do 266, and then we're going to do 60. Let's go ahead and play it first, and then we'll break it down. Okay, so there was the tone that we had. Now, based on what we did in the previous program, you can probably start to figure out what's happening here. So first of all, we have the sound command. This first value can be either one or two. Now, the one and two refers to the two channels that the TED is capable of. It is so hard for me not to say SID chip because we're so used to that with the Commodore 64, but the TED chip is producing the sound here. So we're gonna use channel one. You can use two channels simultaneously as we'll talk about a little bit later, but for now we're just gonna use one single channel, channel one. What's the difference between one and two? Well. One is just a tone generator. Channel two is a tone generator and a white noise generator. Now you can't use both of those together. It's either a tone generator or a white no noise generator. It can't be both. And we'll show you how to do that here in just a little bit. But for now we're gonna use one. This next value, 266, 
is based on a table of values that give us specific tones or notes, as you can see in the graphic. So if I look at 266, that falls out of my tone range that I have on my screen that I shared with you. But you can imagine that because it's 266, it's a low tone. And we heard that it was a pretty low tone. We'll come back and actually plug in a value here in just a minute for an actual note. This next variable over here, 60, is 60th of a second. So if I put 60, 60th of a second, then I get do the math, one second, there we go. So let's go ahead and hit that, try it again. And there's one second of that tone, it's 266. Now, let me go back to my chart and I want to play an E. The note is an E and the value for that is 685. So I program that in, 685. We'll go ahead and keep our tone at 60. I'll press enter. And there's an E. Now, we're doing these commands in immediate mode, right? So I'm just going back up here and I'm changing values. I'm hitting enter and it immediately takes effect. We've talked about immediate mode way back in, I think, in chapter three. So this is a really neat way to just kind of play around with the volume and sound to figure out what sound you want for a program later. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to play around here a little bit with the sound command and the volume command. Okay, now I've used sound chip one. Let's go ahead and go up to two. I want you to see the difference between sound, uh, not chip, but channel, sound channel one versus two. So if I go over here and just put in a two, listen to what happens. And let's go back to the one so that you hear what we had. So as you can see, channel one and channel two do exactly the same thing unless we do something to switch on that white noise channel. And to do that, I do something that seems kind of odd, but it works, so check this out. So instead of sound one or two to give us that musical tone, now we're going to integrate or implement another one called three. Now it's important to note, I'm putting a three in here, we still only have two channels. We have channel one and channel two. I'm just telling channel two to now become a white noise generator. So if I hit enter now, listen. That's a completely different tone on that channel than this right here. I think you would agree. Let's go ahead and play around a little bit more with that. Let's go ahead and do a, let's go back to our three. So if you use a three channel, this is a great way to play around and listen to find that perfect special effect you're looking for for that game. There, that could be like a, a really low crash or rumble, maybe a tank rumbling through uh, some kind of field. One, zero, two, zero, there we go. So there you go, there's, a, there's an interesting little sound for you. So again, you can just kind of play around with the sounds to see what are available on the white noise channel. That's kind of cool. Now they don't necessarily go high, they do go higher in pitch, but it's not necessarily, an ex you're not gonna be able to anticipate what that sound probably is. So I'd recommend you just kind of sit around, uh, play around with the values and find some of those values and then write down maybe this sounds like a this and this sounds like a that. So I'm gonna play around a little bit more with this value so you can hear more tones. Gotta look at my keyboard sometimes. Let me talk a little bit about channel three, just a little bit more. So there are specific values in the channel three that you need to know. So any numbers between 600 and 940 will create that white noise. So let me go ahead and do a uh, 600 for you. So this is white noise, right? Let me go ahead and make this a little bit longer so you can hear the white noise for just a extended period of time. So that's white noise. Uh, and if I do 600 and maybe I do 700, you know, so white noise just changes in, in uh, pitch and it goes a little bit higher. Let's come back up here again to 800. Whoops, 800. And remember 940 is the last value 
that gives me white noise. So there's different values or different levels or different tones of white noise. Now, if I go to 941, what happens? According to the manual, it says that anything above 940 starts to produce interesting sound effects. And we're starting to see that. The sound's a little bit more distorted, a little more otherworldly, a little more electronic. Let's go ahead and uh, take this up to, say, 71. So you can start to hear that, right? Uh, let's go back down to 500. So, well, first, let me show you 600 again is white noise. If we go back below that for 500. According to the manual, this is not white noise. Uh, this is some kind of special effect. Maybe a little bit, but really what it's doing is it's taking that tone generator and just modifying the sound a little bit beyond the 600 to 940 range to create special effects. And that's what a lot of programmers probably took advantage of when they were trying to create games for the Plus 4 and the C16. Okay, I want to demonstrate how you can in fact run two TED channels, sound channels, at exactly the same time. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to set here a volume of two. And now what I've done is I've created two sound commands in immediate mode back to back. So I have this line already prepared. You can see the sound is going to run on channel one for a duration of a thousand, which is quite a few seconds. And after I enter that, then I'm going to go ahead and enter the next one, which is going to activate channel two. Let's see what this sounds like. So first of all, let's activate channel one. Now you'll see the cursors move down while channel one's going. Now I'm going to activate channel two by hitting return. And you can hear both of those channels in unison working together. And those will continue on until the time runs out. And there you go. And of course, you can do that within a program. Let's go ahead and do something fun. Let's go ahead and change this one to three. And if you remember, three becomes a uh, white noise or sound generator. So I'm going to go ahead and shorten this first so you can hear what this is going to sound like. So you got kind of that, that gargling kind of sound. And so now we're going to run both of these at the same time. So I'm going to go ahead and start this one. And then let's add the sound on top of it from channel one. So again, you can think about how you can combine channels and sounds from channels to create even more unique sounds. Now you know how to use the volume command, that's easy, and you know how to use the sound command with those two channels. Now what we're gonna do is take advantage of that to start playing around and use those commands in ways that do things like play songs, sound effects, and even give us interactive programs. So let's get started with that with a little variation on a theme, pun intended, for the next program in the user's manual called well, I call it, they don't call it anything, but I call it musical range. Let's go ahead and see if that's loaded up on our companion disc image. And there you go, you see it right there. Let's go ahead and clear our screen. Let's list that program. And let's see if we can figure out what this does based on what we've already learned. I think this is pretty easy. I don't think you all have problems with this. Volume seven, let's crank up the volume. X is equal to zero. Let's set that value to zero. Let's do something until X is equal to 1020. And what is that doing? What are we doing? We're going to play a sound on channel one for some variable that we're going to establish down here for a duration of five sixtieths of a second. So we're going to X is going to be equal to X plus five. So we're gonna do sounds in increments of five all the way up to one zero two zero. Got it? Pretty easy, right? This is not rocket science here for sure. This is musical science. Let's go ahead and run it and see what it sounds like. I feel like I'm running out of breath. Headache time. Oh my goodness. So there you go. There are all the sounds in increments of five all the way from zero up to one zero two zero. It's a simple program. And again, it just kind of shows that musical loop or that range or not loop, but that musical range. If we put this in a loop, we'd really drive ourselves nuts, but it shows us the range. Okay. And this next one takes advantage of that 
ability to create sound effects. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use musical tones to kind of create a musical sound effect, if that makes sense. It will once we play it. So I'm going to go ahead and load this from our disk image. And I call this one on the disk sound effect. By the way, again, these are not named in the book. These are all my names. So if you don't like them, change them. Make them whatever you want. They can be whatever name you like. Let's go ahead and list this program from the user's guide. Very simple, four lines. Line 10, setting volume all the way. We're cranking this one up. And then we're going to do a four next loop. 4S is equal to 1,000 to 700, step negative 25. So what's happening there? It's going to start at 1,000. It's going to go backwards to 700 in increments of 25. And then it's going to take that S variable, plug it into the sound. We're going to be playing channel one. Plug in that variable for really quick, just like 60th, 60th of us. I mean, just short. And then we're going to next S, go back until we complete that whole range of variables. And this is going to give us a unique kind of sound effect. You ready? Let's go ahead and run this. Hmm, that's kind of fun, isn't it? Let's do that again. Ooh, I like that. Go back over and do that again. Ah, so where could you use that? Sure sounds like a great video game sound, doesn't it? Something we definitely have heard in other video games on other systems, including uh, the Commodore 64 and probably VIC-20. And there you go. There is a simple program that will create a simple sound effect using channel one which is the musical channel using musical notes. Now what we're going to do is use the sound generator on channel two, the white noise generator, to create a natural sound that has a really random pattern to it, which is, a, it's actually a lot of fun. I've, I really enjoyed this program. So I'm going to go ahead and list this program. I've already loaded it from our companion disk image. Let's go up and take a look at what we have going on here. And uh, I'll do my best to, to describe this in such a way that it uh, sort of makes sense. Uh, I will tell you, I had to go through it a couple of times myself because it's really, once you hear the program, I think you'll understand how the lines of code generate the sounds that are being produced. But I kind of want to save that to the end. So I'm going to go through once, just talk about it. 10 is volume. We know what that does. This next line is really the secret sauce for this program. And what's happening is it's setting our to a random value between one and zero, okay? The zero just basically after the uh, function ra ran random number here is the seeding. So either it's a brand new seed every time it starts or if we used a one, it would be a seed that wasn't regenerated each time. Uh, if you wanna know more about that, check out the encyclopedia, a lot of great information on that or look into random number theory and you can get a lot of that. Then what we're gonna do is take that value and between zero and one, multiply it by 10, and then we're gonna add one. So really what we're getting here is we're getting a number, a random number between one and 11. That's really what this whole line is doing. It's just creating a random number between one and 11. So that's what R does. Then X is gonna say for one is equal to one to R. What's R? That's that random value we got here. And it's going to take that variable and it's going to play this sound that number of times because you see that it's a four next loop so it's going to keep going through there once it's done playing that we're not going to reset yet we're going to come down here we're going to say hey now for x equals r to one step backwards one right negative one and then we're going to play this so we're going to start to get this variation this up and down sound so remember i just said that because i think you'll hear that we do our next x x which uh, again is part of that loop. We come down here to T, which again is looking for another random value. Can you guess what it, this one is? We got zero times 100 plus 30. So any number between one, between zero and 130 is what we're looking for. Random number between zero and 130. And then we come down here and we're gonna plug that value into our T uh, value here for this sound and then we're going to go to 20 which pops us back up here and the whole thing starts over again so uh, hopefully i've got that right i know that if i miss something in there 
You guys are great. You provide great feedback. Let me know. Drop them in the comments. Drop them on the companion blog posts in the discuss forum. Uh, but feel free to correct me if I've missed something there. Happy to be corrected. Trust me. I have thick skin. You ready? Let's see what this does. This is pretty cool. I like this one. So this is a little program I called Windstorm. So if you want a white noise generator in your hotel room and you want a nice calm windstorm in the background to help you sleep when those people up top of you are banging on the floor and dropping suitcases, yelling and screaming and slamming doors at night. Can you tell I've traveled a lot? Uh, take your plus four with you, set it up, get a big speaker system amplified or some headphones and play this program all night long. There you go. That's This is why we need portable Commodore plus four computers. Hmm, that's an idea. Okay, let me go ahead and exit this. And I told you we'd play around a little bit. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and modify this random value a little bit. And instead of doing one or zero to 11, let's, let's do 20. Let's see how that modifies this program. You can see it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, there you go. There's our illegal quantity. So that's the important piece here is that when you're creating random numbers and if you exceed the value that is allowed for a specific area, which is what happened to us here, then we're going to get issues. So you have to be careful with that. Let's go ahead and plug our 10 back in, but you could tell right before it bombed out, it was doing some extended kind of sounds. Let's go ahead and put our one back in there. What else can we change? What if we were to come over here and change this to, let's say plus 50. Oh, that's dangerous, but let's see what happens. No, so I'm playing around with the sound to change the tones. And that one quickly got illegal, uh, illegal quantity because it's such a large value. But it was kind of interesting to listen to that sound. So again, you can kind of play around with this, find out what is, what isn't allowed and modify those sounds. I am gonna try something different here. I'm gonna take this and make this 200 and we're gonna rerun this again. Notice that first is a little lower and then it jumps up. First, a little bit lower jumps up a little lower random value jumps up that's that's kind of cool uh let's match those two now let's take this 600 and also make it a 200 uh, i'm gonna go ahead and leave this one 600 so we can see that real drastic jump in between those three ranges so by messing around with those values you can see when they come into play and, and hear the random nature of the tones and then finally let's go ahead and make them all kind of that lower wind storm, much deeper wind storm, more threatening, more ominous wind storm. You know what? Let's go ahead and crank up the volume, shall we? That's the, that's the part I really just have the most fun with these programs out of these users' manuals. And this is where you learn the most is when you just go through and you just play with values and find out what you can and can't do. Don't, let, don't worry about these errors. Those are gonna happen. Just make the correction, go back and try it again. Oh, that's loud. I really like that. I'm gonna do one more, and uh, I know this is a long episode, but hey, it's fun. Let's do eight. I think this is gonna give me a little illegal quantity. Let's see if we can make it more like maybe an alien windstorm, a little higher. That's kind of cool. All right, so there you go. There is our program Windstorm. Up to this point, the computer's done all the work. It's time for us to get our hands dirty, get our fingers busy, and start pounding out some tunes. Well, we need a program in order to do that, and this next program is simply one I've entitled Piano. Let's go ahead and list our program and take a look and see what happens here. Now again, we're only really using two commands for sound, volume and sound, uh, but you're gonna see a lot of the things that we've learned in previous chapters come into play into this chapter. So first of all, we're gonna clear our screen. We've got a loop going on here, and through that loop from one to eight, we're having it read something. Now remember the read command 
always has a data command somewhere. And our data command is down in line 1110. So it's going to read eight separate values from the data statements. What are those values? Well, they're 169, 262, 343, 383, so on and so forth. But what are those values? Well, those are musical tones. So when I hit a key from one to eight, I'm going to get one of those specific tones. Now, these are lower tones than what we showed you earlier with our musical scale. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this program is it does have some error trapping, so it will continue to play tunes as long as you hit one through eight. And that's what this line's doing here. It's getting your input. It's checking it to make sure that it's a valid input, which is kind of what's happening here. And then it's jumping. If it doesn't get an input back to line 40 and it just waits for you to input. When you do input, it takes that value. It gets the ASCII value of that string. Then it compares it against less than 49 or greater than 56. If you look at those values, that's a number between one and eight. 49 is the one character on the keyboard. It's the Petsky code for that character. Keep that in mind. So we go through uh, and we take that Petsky value minus that ASCII value to give us the true value. Now we don't really need this line. We could have just done a conversion, let it go, and then figured it out from there. But they've chosen in this program to go ahead and convert it down to the real character, the one through eight. Then what happens is it plays a sound. It plays the sound of N at the N, which is from the read up here, which is from the value down here. And then it's going to play it for this duration right here, 5 sixtieths. Now, the other fun thing about this program is not only are we going to get a sound, it's going to pull some of the information that we learned from our graphics chapter and change the color of the screen as we type a note. This is a lot of fun. I think you're going to enjoy this as you see it. And then we're just going to keep looping until A equals 32. Well, what is 32? Well, my old Petsky days, I happen to remember that one. That is a space bar. So it will keep looping as long as you're hitting a proper key or number, one through eight, and then it will finally exit when you hit the space bar. So our space bar is our way out of this thing. Let's run it. Now, notice, no sounds, nothing happening. So I should hit one and we should get a tone. Got a tone and we got a screen color change. What happens if we hit two? Got another tone, a little higher up on the scale, a little color change. Aha, now this is getting fun. I do like the complementary colors of the border and the screen. And, and finally, so there's our range, our whole scale. There you go, I feel like I, I made a song. I hit the space bar and I'm out and back to my regular colors. So that is the piano program. It's a lot of fun, play with it. Now it is very limited, but you can imagine if you go in and add some more data statements, some more uh, sound codes, you could add some of the sharps and flats into your scale and you could even extend the scale and start to use your keyboard as a real piano. Okay, it is concert time. A one and a two and a... Let's try that again, shall we? <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so embarrassed. Here we go, let's try that again. There you go. There's my musical number for you today. That's actually in the user's manual. Check it out. That, of course, was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Hopefully I don't get a copyright flag for my production of that tune. Now, as much fun as that is, maybe I'm back to, I don't want to play the tune because gee, I make a lot of mistakes, as you just saw in my little musical number. What if we want the computer to play the song for us? Well, we can do that, and we're going to do that in this next little program I like to call Rowboat. Can you guess what song that's going to play? 
All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this before we actually play it. Now, this is this is really good code to learn if you want to play some music within your basic program. Uh, I'm really, uh, I really think this is a good example of how you can start to create programs of your own that play music, songs that you like, right? Now, this is, of course, row boats. It's going to play row, row, row your boat. Uh, one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't do rounds, so don't be all expecting craziness with rounds. But if you think about it, with our two channels, we could do row, row, row your boat on channel one, start a channel two, and do a round with two channels going at once doing it. That probably would have been a good exercise for them to include. They didn't do that. But think about that. Maybe give that a shot on your own. I'm not going to do that. I'll leave that up to you. But if anybody does it, let me know. I'd love to see the code for that and love to hear it because a round of row, row, row your boat on the Commodore Plus 4 is something I would appreciate. So let's go ahead and look at this quickly. Volume 8, we get that. We know we're going to do, we're going to read. What are we reading? We're reading X and Y. Now, this gets a little interesting because it's going to read an X value and a Y value. So we know we have a data statement. How does that work? Well, this first 169 is our X value. This 45 is our Y value. It's going to take that and it's going to plug it into here. Now, if you remember your sound command, you know that sound 1 is channel 1. X is going to be a frequency. That first frequency is 169. What was that Y? Do you remember? That's the duration. So the duration here is 45 sixtieths of a second, right? So you can see what we're doing is we're playing a tune for a specific duration. It's going to read that. It's going to loop back up, and it's going to do the next series of data, which is 169.45, 169.30. So row, row, row your boat, right? So that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to get that in there. And then you see we have D, which is a counter from 1 to 550. This is where things are, this program, I would just just tell you right off the bat, this could be better. This is not, It's it, I mentioned it's a great program to teach you. It's probably not the best way to do this. I think we can get a more natural sound. And you'll know what I mean by I say natural sound when I play it. But I think there's a way to get a better rendition of row, row, row your boat than this program. But this is what we're stuck with with the user's manual. We're going to go with it. And then you see we have an end. So it, there is a definite end. And it will end when it hits the last data statement and plays row, row, row your boat. Should we just do it and row our boats? Let's row our boats right now. Okay, here we go. It's kind of like the William Shatner of Row, Row, Row Your Boats. Tonight's show is about you. <laughs> I'm only here to help you find the you, you, inside of you. Consider ways that maybe you can use this code, modify it, and smooth it out, and then also add a round to it. You can do it. I know you can. As a matter of fact, this is something I'm going to be playing with because it needs to be better than this. It's like it's just not sure what note's coming next, right? Almost. Can I be so bold to say that my rendition of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star was better than the Plus Four's rendition of Row 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 Your Boat? No? Okay. Let's do another one where the plus four takes the reins and plays us a tune. And this one is a little ditty, I, a little ditty, little ditty I like to call bar scales. Let's go ahead and take a look at this program and see what it looks like. Got a lot of randomness going on here, uh, but we do have some notes. And let me just say another disaster, this one, uh, you see, I have very little hair. What one I had left, I probably pulled out trying to figure out what the errors were in this program. It was a wreck, but I finally figured it out, persevered, got through, figured it out, and I think I have what they were wanting in the original user's manual. So we set our volume, we have another do loop, we set some variables to some random values between zero 
and whatever uh, we have. So here, zero through seven. So this is a, a duration, as you can see here. Uh, this is the start, this is the range, this is what it's setting for us, right? The P is our steps. We're gonna step through the program at a, at a random value. So again, we're just generating some values for random values for duration, our start, our range, and our step. I appreciate that they added the code or the comments afterwards because that was helpful. Then we're gonna come down to T and we're gonna generate another random value using the sign. So we're getting a random plus or negative value and then we're going to assign that to another random value as part of a range, whether we're stepping up or stepping back. So here we go. Here's the actual for next loop. So for Z is equal to S, which is the uh, start to the start plus T, which is that sign value, right? Negative one or positive one uh, or positive value uh, times the R, which is our range. And then we're gonna step through it at our steps times a sign, so either up or down, because remember we can step positive or we can step negative, which is in reverse. So that's what's happening there. That's pretty confusing. Hopefully I did a decent job for you. Then we're gonna assign uh, or establish our sound value, which is one to Z, which is the frequency, and D, which is the duration. Z again is coming from here, right, for Z. What is that value of Z? That's where that's coming from. And then we're gonna come down to Y, and Y is gonna do some fun things with our random values, and then come down here and start to color our screen and provide a little color play along with our bar scales that are being played. And then of course our next X, next Z to step back up, and then our loop finishing it up as part of our do and loop. Whew, that's a tricky one right there. Uh, it's not as complicated as, it's, as it looks, and I think it makes a lot, again, like all these programs, it makes more sense when you play it, the program, and then you can kind of visualize in your mind what each one of those lines of code are doing. So without further ado, shall we? So you can hear those random values being presented as well as those random colors on the left-hand side of the screen. Yeah, you know, the, the left-hand side of the screen, it's kind of fun, but can we do more with it? Color one, color one. There we go. Let me go ahead and list that. And I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to come back up to here where it says print. And you'll see it's printing a space to give us that one character over on the left. Eh, let's change that. Let's Instead of doing this, let's do this. And I'm gonna go right there and close that and hit enter. Now, let's run it and see what happens. Now, what's interesting is, you notice it's not as fast. This is really also a good demonstration to show you that that TED chip is having to handle both that screen and that sound and it's really struggling to do both at the same time. And this is where those, sep those chips being separated gives you a speedier computer, say on the Commodore 64 with the SID. Now, if we were to do this in machine language instead of basic, that would speed this up a little bit, but you can definitely tell the difference. Let's go back and change that so you can see the difference again. If I can type. It's hard to type with that chartreuse green. Back that way up. We'll do two this time, just so you can see. And run. You can see it's a lot more responsive. Remembering though that the, the beat values are randomized for that duration. So there you go. That is a little program I call bar scales. All right, I'm going to Clear my screen here. And we are now on our final program of chapter eight. We're also on our final program of chapters one through eight of the user's manual. This is a program you would expect would just amp up our game and bring everything forward that we have used and make this amazing program that does these amazing things. And well, it kind of lives up to that. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. And this is something I call the music machine. Uh, and it, it, it really does kind of use a lot of those 
concepts that we've learned in past chapters, roll it all up, but also use the volume and sound command in a fun way, but also capture some really interesting visuals. And again, takes those uh, concepts from chapter eight, combines it with the chapter, or I'm sorry, those concepts in the graphics chapter with the concepts in chapters eight, and really does a nice job of creating the basics of a program that you could play around with yourself, extend, and have a pretty fun program. And again, I call this Music Machine. Now this is the longest program we've had up to this point. And it would be difficult to kind of go through this line by line. I'm gonna, as you can see, it's, it's already more than one screen. It does go beyond uh, two screens full of code. It takes a while to type. I did type this one in. It was another disaster of a program in the user's manual. Lots of typos, lots of missing characters. Again, another hair was lost in the making or fixing of this program, but I finally got it working and I'm pretty pleased that uh, I was able to figure out because there, there were some real challenges there. I, at one point I thought, I'm not gonna be able to figure this out myself because I don't know what they're doing. I put it away for a while, came back a couple of days later, and immediately saw the error. And that's what happens a lot of times when you're working with code. Your eyes just start to see all the same characters and uh, sometimes you just have to put it aside and then come back to it. And that's exactly what happened. So I'm sure that's, you know, for, for a seasoned coder, maybe they would have got it just like that. But for me, it was a little bit of a struggle. Okay, let's go ahead and see if we can list the first few lines here. Okay, so here are the first couple of lines. We have five, we have a go sub 1000, which jumps all the way down to this line right here. Again, I'm not gonna try and go through every line. I just wanna hit a few highlights here. So here again is a four next loop. We've done that. We've got a read command. We know we have some data. We have a data down in line 100. Uh, so we know we're gonna be grabbing that data. Now this harkens back to our chapter on graphics where we're going to going to combine a graphics screen along with characters. So we're gonna, we're gonna change to a, a graphic mode one, and then we're gonna add the great music machine. We're setting our volume, we've got a loop, we're looking for some values from our keyboard, and we'll see that as we go. We're going to, again, looking between 49 and 57, you can probably figure that out from our previous piano program, what's gonna happen there. Uh, then we go down, we see some conversion, we play some sounds, we've got some shapes now, and we've not really talked about this G-shape command. Uh, it is covered in the encyclopedia. Um, we spent a little, I think just a short amount of time talking about it, but if you want to learn more, look in the encyclopedia, and I think I'm going to probably come back to that when I talk about the encyclopedia as we finish up the, the user's manual. So there are shapes that are being created, and you're going to see those uh, and what that shape looks like when we play the program. It's actually pretty, pretty creative. We've got some looping going on. We've already talked about it. We've got uh, graphics mode being created. Let's go ahead and list the rest of it. Uh, you see up here our graphics mode. We're going to do some drawing on the screen. Uh, again, a couple of sub loops here. We've got this, what is this? This F-E-D-C-B. Uh, for those of you who are musical out there, you know exactly what that is. Those are notes on our scale that are going to be displayed on our screen. So again, keep thinking about that. Here's another loop. Uh, we've got some, um, some if statement going on here. If certain things happen, then do these things. We've got some character creation. Uh, in the, within the character creation, we've got some spacing. Place that character from the middle, place it from the right, so get, grab the strings, just all kinds of cool stuff going on here. So S-shape S and G-shape are used to save and restore rectangular areas of multicolor or high resolution screens per the manual down here. So again, we've not really used those, but this program is going to use those pretty effectively. And again, it, maybe it's a concept that I do look at when I go through the commands in the encyclopedia. All right, let's just run this thing. You want to? And let me show you what works and hopefully I, I, I save the right version of this without errors. Now this is, pretty, this is pretty nice. So on our screen, you see the great music machine on the left, we have our notes, and on the right, we have our corresponding key presses. So if you want to play an E, you press one. If you want to play an F, you press two. Now we've had something similar when we played uh, the piano program, right? This one just gives us more on-screen visuals. It's got a really great layout, and uh, pretty cool that we've done this with basic programs. So keep those fingers crossed, here we go. Now, notice when I hit one, watch what happens. 
we get this great note that's represented, this character that's represented to show that that is the note we're hitting. So if I hit one, you see I get a little note on one. If I hit two, it's right in between the E and the G, right? If I hit three. Now what's impressive for me though is if you look at that note, it reverses the line within the note when it's on top of the line, right? It doesn't do it here because it doesn't do, it doesn't overlap it. But when it does here, it puts that reverse for us. And we can go all the way up to there. Now what happens if I go above that with zero? Nothing. So that error trapping is built in. So, And there you go. So that is the great music machine. And that is the final program in our, oh, by the way, spacebar exits out of that one. And that is the, uh, the final program in our user's manual. And I do think it is probably a good one to end this chapter. And again, a good one just to end the entire user's manual because it uses so much of what we've already learned. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, the encyclopedia does have other programs, and my goal is probably to take a look at those. But for now, that completes chapters one through eight, if you can believe it, of the Commodore Plus Four User's Manual. Can't believe I made it all the way through. I hope you enjoyed that little musical foray around chapter eight. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, the user's manual is far from done. We've gone through chapters one through eight, but there is a whole section of the user's manual entitled the Commodore Plus Four Encyclopedia. And some of the concepts and topics that are included are of course a basic 3.5 encyclopedia. So every single command available, uh, there are basic 3.5 abbreviations, conversion programs, error messages. There's the TED monitor or the assembly language monitor. Hmm, that sounds interesting. I really want to get into that. There are screen display color codes. And we, we've talked about those in previous episodes, uh, but there's more details there to be had. It has a section on ASCII and character strings, which we've talked about a little bit. Screen and color memory maps, memory register map. What is a memory register map? I love this one, deriving mathematical functions. We'll get our math geek on and talk about that. Musical note table. We spent a little bit of time on that today, but there is more information in the encyclopedia for creating sound and music that we should probably take some time to dive through. Section 12 of the Commodore Plus Four Encyclopedia is entitled Programs to Try. Sounds like a lot of great content for my Plus Four User's Guide Companion Disc, which if you don't have, get over there and download it, or wait till I get through the rest of the content and download it, or download it now, download it then, download it again, keep downloading it. Let me know if you like that companion .d81 disc image. Also enjoy that there is a section on RS-232 guidelines. Wondering what RS-232 is? Don't worry, if we cover that, we will do it. And then finally, I love this chapter 14, a book list, things, other things we should read. So how am I going to attack that? I thought about going step by step and probably will. There's, there's 14 sections. I will probably not do each section as a separate video, but try and combine those. So while this concludes chapters one through eight of the user's manual, know that there's more coming. I also have a couple of other fun things to do. For instance, I am going to attempt to get the plus four on the internet connected to a BBS. So for now, it's kind of a little temporary hiatus from our Commodore Plus Four user's manual. We'll have a couple of other videos before I get back to the appendix, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. Make sure you leave those comments below, read that video description for all the links. Check out the companion blog post. That is so important. It has everything you needed for not just this episode, but you'll find links to all those episodes and learn more about how to use the Commodore Plus Four. Oh, and did I mention most of this also works on the Commodore C16? So tell your friends that they can use their C16. And that concludes this edition of Retro Combs. Retro Combs out.